have you here tonight. Reflux disease, is there a cure? We call it uh, gastroesophageal reflux disease. Now, one of the most important things for reflux disease is keeping up on your water. I can see some of you brought your water, and from time to time I'll demonstrate how you're supposed to use that water. <laughs> just to keep up <clears throat> on our hydration. Well, Jeanette came with pain in her chest. Doctors ruled out any heart problems and sent her over to the gastroenterologist and started checking her out for reflux. Well, they figured it must be reflux, so they tried her on multiple drugs. This drug and that drug. And the drugs <coughs> are definitely there to uh, cause you to have less acid in your stomach. That's their usual goal. And so she tried these different uh, acid-reducing drugs. And as a result of all these acid-reducing drugs, she got osteoporosis. But still, no cure for her reflux disease. Well, the doctor started uh, thinking, well, maybe you just uh, think, you know, maybe you just think you have pain. Maybe, maybe it's all in your head. Well, if it's all in your head, we better give you head pills. So they started giving her tranquilizers. Here, have some Valium. It's all in your head. Well, that always makes a patient happy to know that the doctor thinks it's all in their head. Um, patients usually get sort of upset when you suggest that. So we'll, we'll talk about Jeanette here as we go along. But uh, just realize that there is side effects to some of these uh, acid-reducing drugs because there's a reason why your stomach has acid. And uh, so we'll come back to that. Now, around the world, there's a lot of reflux disease, especially in countries that are more developed and countries with diets that have a lot more spices. You say the United States is quite high on the list, Sweden, UK. Here we are, Australia. You can see the colors tell you how prevalent the disease is, even China and Korea. So there's a lot of, a lot of reflux around the world and a lot of people suffering with it. So I used to treat things more conventionally, but uh, for the last 14 years I've been studying diseases in the light of what caused it. A lot of times you never get the idea of what caused it. You go to the doctor and you know, you say, well, every time I do this, it hurts. And the doctor says, well, just don't do that anymore. But uh, <laughs> it doesn't always go that far. Usually it's, uh, well, I've got cancer. Why'd you get cancer? Well, I don't know why you got cancer, but we have a cure. And here's, here's chemo and here's radiation and here's surgery. Or you got a, a sore joint. It must be a deficiency of paracetamol. Here, let me write you out a script for paracetamol. But uh, I like to figure out what caused it. What's going on here? It's a bit of an investigative journey. And so hopefully you'll learn from my investigative journey about what causes these things. And, and once you realize what's causing it, um, it helps to know how to fix it. So reflux disease can be reversed with simple lifestyle changes and natural remedies. And what do we have there? Ginger, you know ginger is very good for settling a stomach. A lot of uh, pregnant women will use it for nausea and vomiting during uh, pregnancy. And it's helpful. Well, overview of where we're headed, we're going to talk about the lower esophageal sphincter and its failure. I'll show you where that is. Uh, it's right to here. Uh, this is the esophagus, the lower sphincter. Their sphincter is like valve. Um, it's what keeps things from coming up. We'll talk about acid buildup. That's what comes from your stomach is lots of acid. We're going to talk about sources of pressure that push things back up your esophagus. Sort of the mechanics of reflux. And then we'll talk about the beneficial lifestyle choices and simple natural remedies. That's where we're headed. First of all though, 10 top symptoms of reflux. Here they are. Food or drink coming back up the throat. That's really the definition of reflux. But uh, uh, acid or sour taste in the mouth or throat. Maybe at the time during the day or you wake up uh, in the morning feeling like you've had something acid in your mouth. Then there's bloating of the stomach area. Feeling sort of full and like things aren't passing down like they should be. Chest pain. 
pain maybe behind your sternum or lower down, feeling that food won't go down. You just can't push any more down for some reason. And then there's burning pain in the stomach area, down a little lower with the pain. Instead of thinking of it as coming from the heart, you think of it as coming a little lower. Sore or full feeling in the throat. And this can be from the burning of the esophagus or scarring of the esophagus. And then there's pain behind the breastbone, post sternal pain. Hoarseness, sore throat or sore voice box. And last of all, frequent coughing. People who cough a lot could be having reflux. Top 10 reflux symptoms. There they are. Uh, some of you may not have realized uh, that you had signs of reflux, but it's good to think about it in terms of what the common signs are. So a lot of times reflux is misdiagnosed as something else because we're more, uh, usually more worried about uh, dangerous things like heart attacks. But let's talk about the mechanical and chemical causes of heartburn and reflux. First of all, it's definitely dysfunction of the lower esophageal sphincter. When that thing doesn't work, then stuff comes up. It's like having a valve stem on your car that's always leaking, or having a valve in your house that's always leaking at the sink uh, at the basin or something. So you don't want that valve to get too loose or stuff will come up the esophagus. The next is the amount of acid that your stomach is producing. And we'll, this is a, a basically an outline of, of where I'm going to head next with uh, what happens at these different levels and what affects them. But the stomach, the more acid it gets, the more likely you are to have pain here in the esophagus. Now, the volume of what's in your stomach can affect you. I mean, if you have way too much in your stomach, it's got to go somewhere, and it probably won't go down. It'll come up. And then slow emptying. There's a valve at the other end of the stomach, the pyloric valve, and if that valve isn't opening to let things go into the small intestine, then you get backed up traffic or backed up food. And then finally, sometimes the colon gets congested and you get backfill or slow transit. And if things aren't moving on below the stomach, the stomach can't send its contents down into the intestines. So this is a mechanical and chemical look at uh, what happens with lower esophageal, um, well, basically with reflux, but with lower esophageal burning. Now, let's just start out with the lower esophageal sphincter dysfunction. And there are certain things that if you eat them, they cause that sphincter not to tighten down, not to close up. It's, it's like, uh, you know, sometimes you try to turn off the valve in the bathroom and the sink and it just won't stop dripping and the harder you, you know it's time to call a plumber, right? Well, <laughs> this thing starts leaking but you can't call the plumber or the plumber might do some things you may not want and so things that make it so that sphincter doesn't work are high fat foods, fried foods, full fat dairy. For some reason fat makes that sphincter incompetent and you will end up with stuff leaking back up the esophagus. So these are things that chemically, or I guess that'd be the best way to say, biologically affect the sphincter. Next one is things with caffeine or any of the caffeine relatives like theobromine, tea, coffee, chocolate. All of these have been studied and found to cause decreased strength, a decreased pressure in the valve at the bottom of your esophagus. And soft drinks. Now, two reasons on them, or maybe three reasons. One, they raise the acid. Two, they have the caffeine. And number three, they create pressure. You know, they have all those bubbles and so forth. And so you'll have more pressure to blow things back up your esophagus. Irritating. Then, nicotine. It has a direct effect on relaxing that sphincter when you don't want it relaxed. Alcoholic beverages, similarly, make it so that you will not be able to close that sphincter down effectively. And then there's things that create colonic fermentation. I mean, in laboratory animals, if we want to create colonic fermentation, we give them a little apple cider vinegar in their colon and we get colonic fermentation. So that's why I put that there. But anyway, when there's fermentation down here, all those uh, fermenting products from uh, bacteria that are putting off their toxins affect the lower uh, esophageal sphincter. 
So those are the things that definitely affect the pressure in the valve. Now you can just figure if the valve was tight enough, nothing would ever come up, right? It, and if, if you just sewed off the esophagus down there, nothing would come up. So you know that if the stuff is coming up, it had to make it past that sphincter. So this just makes it so that sphincter doesn't close very well. Now we want to move on to things that create acid in the stomach. Raise the acid, increase the acid. It's like building a bigger and bigger fire or a hotter fire. And so anything that increases the acid in the stomach makes it so that anything that leaks past the lower esophageal sphincter is going to cause more symptoms, cause more pain, cause more burning, cause more scarring. And so we want to look at things that increase the acid in the stomach. Some of these will be the same. Maybe you've seen these before, right? We already talked about these, but caffeine, it definitely raises the acid in the stomach. And, uh, but there's certain things about different ones of these that uh, create more acid. Uh, the, the sodas already have the acid, usually the phosphoric acid, and, and yes, they have some carbonic acid. Tea is loaded with fluoride that tends to create acid, and the coffee has a lot of acidic oils in it. Even if you decaf it, it'll have those acidic oils that will be irritating. So these are products that will compete with your drug that you're taking, <laughs> hopefully not taking, for uh, acid uh, reflux. Now, fast foods and animal protein. Animal protein is very hard to digest. Most animals that uh, we traditionally think of as uh, carnivores, cats, lions, you know, they have a much more acid stomach than we do. They produce a lot more acid because it's very hard to untangle all the protein in a muscle of some cow or, or sheep or beast of some kind. And so that added acid is going to make for more burning on heartburn. Now, sugar and refined carbohydrates definitely increase the acid in your stomach. And uh, this is sort of a biochemical uh, factory down there and you put different things in and things change. Some things you just know are going to cause burning. I mean hot peppers and people who eat more hot peppers or curry or black pepper, these things definitely will increase heartburn, definitely increase uh, the pain in the esophagus and lead to what we call Barrett's esophagus and cancer eventually. But We'll get to that a little later when we talk about Barrett's esophagus. Mixing fruits and vegetables at the same meal. Notice we have tomatoes, we have cucumbers, and we have capsicum, and then we have onions. Well, wait a minute. A tomato, cucumber, and capsicum are all fruit because they have seeds, whereas the onion and the lettuce and, and the carrots, uh, they all are vegetables. And so beware of that when you mix the two. It takes two different digestive processes to, to work on the different things and also different bacteria probiotics come with onions versus capsicum or tomatoes versus lettuce and so you'll have a war in your stomach and you'll end up with more heartburn, more inflammation. Salty foods, tin foods, a lot of foods you don't realize have lots of salt. For example, tomatoes will often have more salt than some of the junk foods that we traditionally think have lots of salt. Uh, even corn flakes, well, and Cheerios or, or yeah, different types of breakfast cereals will have more sodium than some things uh, like cheese. But all these are high in salt and all these, the increased salt will definitely cause you to have more reflux and more burning reflux, more acid in your stomach and you'll suffer because of it. Then there's psychological stress and worry, fear, anger, regret. Um, and uh, there's a famous uh, gentleman back in the 1800s that uh, somebody shot him through the stomach. He lived, but there was a hole in his stomach. They decided from then on out they'd use him as a science experiment. And they would aggravate him, make him angry, and his stomach would get all red and inflamed. And then they'd give him, put some alcohol down there and see what happened. They put all kinds of things. He became a, a you know, walking laboratory whether he liked it or not, I guess. And uh, he was a, an experiment that was pretty famous. Anyway, psychological stress breaks down the protective layer of the stomach called mucus. It uh, inflames the stomach. 
through uh, changing of the blood flow and, uh, and also increasing stomach acid. Certain medications, lots of medications, you take them, especially ones for osteoporosis and, and uh, things like that, will definitely inflame the stomach and increase the acid. Now I'm going to put up another one here that may surprise you because you probably thought it would do the exact opposite because it's often used to reduce or supposedly reduce the acid in the stomach. But this one actually has an interesting facet to it and that is if you take some kind of calcium antacid, initially, yeah, it is a bit basic in its uh, chemical makeup, but the calcium itself has the ability or the propensity, the capacity to raise the acid in your stomach. Calcium improves or increases acid production. And so there's this rebound acidity after taking a calcium antacid. So what do you do? Take a malox, like a aluminum-based antacid. Well, if you're thinking about Alzheimer's, you don't want to take aluminum antacids, that's for sure. Because it'll all end up in your brain. And then you get Alzheimer's. Then you won't care anyway. All right. Poor chewing. When you don't chew your food well and you have big chunks down there in your stomach, then the stomach is stimulated to make more acid. It's trying to break the chunks down. It doesn't have teeth. All it has is acid. And if you fail to use your teeth on your food, then it'll try to make up for it with extra acid. So you chew your food especially well so you don't have to deal with the acid. Now, if you don't drink enough water, everything's going to be more concentrated, especially the acid in your stomach, therefore a lower pH. And so you end up with more acid. So drinking plenty of water can help. Let's go talk about a few more mechanical issues now. Remember we said that overfilling of the stomach creates back pressure and drives things back up the esophagus. It's like filling a balloon with air too full and uh, so full you can't get the knot in the end of it and uh, you'll have the air coming out. So we don't want the stomach to be like a balloon overfilled. I mean obviously if you overeat it's going to be overfilled and so a lot of reflux has to do with overeating. I mean that food tastes so good and the fast food restaurant made it so, so irresistible and there was just one last uh, you know hamburger to eat or cookie or sweet biscuit or whatever and you stuff it in and then maybe it doesn't even make it through the esophageal sphincter at the end it's still trying to go down but uh, overfill and uh, yeah you're in trouble now snacking between meals when you eat between meals it stops digestion it makes it so the stomach has to halt all uh, working on your food in order to catch up the snack with the food that's already in the stomach during that time you have much more overfilling and so snacking has been identified as a big problem what you want is at least five hours between meals otherwise you're stacking your meals if you please and you will have more heartburn, more reflux, more stomach pain, more gastritis, more risk of other diseases. Eating fast, eating way fast, and chewing poorly. This sort of goes back with uh, the thoughts we had earlier about it creating acid, but when you don't eat your food well, then your stomach has to sit there and try to break it apart, and it doesn't have any teeth, and uh, so this is a big issue. You put the food down there too fast, and it fills up too fast and you end up with overfilling. And so chewing your food well, in fact most people if they chew their food thoroughly, well it reminds me, so I grew up in Wichita, Kansas and uh, one day the newspaper came out and said in town we have a lady who's 135 years old. So they went to the lady that was 135 years old and they said ma'am why is it that you think you've lived so long? Her answer, well, I chew my food until I can swish it between my teeth before I swallow it. Yeah. All right, well, so if we chewed our food until we could swish it through our teeth, then it would be much less likely to, it would, it would uh, digest faster down at the stomach too. Now, liquid meals, I mean, you put liquid down, liquid's going to come up. And there's a lot of liquid meals. Uh, liquids right after your meals. What are examples of liquid meals? 
soup, porridge, smoothies, juice, you know, all these things that we have that are liquid, well, those are all more likely to come up through the sphincter and also to overfill the stomach. And then drinking with meals. When you drink with a meal, then you're just making it so the stomach has to stop and absorb all that liquid before it can digest, and during that time, much more likely to have it coming up. Now, put a knife to thy throat if thou be a man given to appetite, Solomon says. <laughs> hmm. Blessed art thou a land when thy king is the son of nobles, and thy princes eat in due season, which is at the right time, for strength and not for drunkenness. Some people live to eat, can't wait till the next meal, and some people eat to live. They use their food neck in order to accomplish something. They match their food intake to their work requirements. So that's a very interesting bit of good advice here from Solomon uh, related to appetite. Next we'll think about things that delay the emptying of the stomach. At the end of the stomach there is that pyloric valve. It only opens so when the food is ready to pass on. It usually sends us a, a, a specific amount of food on and only when it's fully digested or ready at least to go into the small intestine. And so there's certain things that uh, are slow to digest, certain things that due to their high calorie content the stomach doesn't want to let out uh, as readily. And so anything high in calories or, or, or caloric density is going to slow stomach emptying. Anything high in fat, high in sugar, uh, and so you can think about different foods that might fit this category. Uh, cold food or very hot food will also slow the stomach, stomach's emptying because the stomach's job is to make the food the right temperature for the small intestine. So if you're eating ice cream, it's going to sit in the stomach until it's no longer ice cream. It's uh, yeah, warm milkshake. And if you're drinking hot chocolate, same idea. It's going to sit there until it cools down and... Uh, the intestine can handle it. So hot and cold, you want food that's more your body temperature if it's going to move on quickly. Now liquids with the meals, soups, juices, porridges, drinks, smoothies, all these end up putting too much liquid in the stomach. The stomach can't digest large amounts of liquid very well and so it absorbs the water portion of the liquid away before it starts uh, digesting um, what's left. And uh, if you've just taken on a huge amount of liquid with your meal, then it's going to sit there for a long time and you're going to be more likely to reflux. So beware of that. Supplement tablets. Some of these supplement tablets get stuck in the stomach for a long time because they're really <laughs> rock hard and <laughs> or have capsules that are near uh, indestructible. And uh, this has been one thing that's been associated with reflux. I mean, any kind of pills. Pills from the doctor, pills from, from your pharmaceutical representative, wherever. Anyway, you end up with these things in your stomach, and if they just sit there... I mean, some people take these supplement tablets, and then they just end up in the toilet as a whole pill. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it's safer that way for the patient, but um, <laughs> you end up not getting any good out of that anyway. So delays in emptying the stomach are caused by things that just don't dissolve. Late evening eating or laying down right after a meal. You see, it takes, it's interesting, if you eat something at breakfast, it digests quickly. You eat the exact same meal for tea in the evening, it'll take twice as long to digest. But if you also lay down after you eat your evening meal, it takes three times as long to digest and just that much more time for things to reflex up and cause you pain. Psychological stress. We've been here before, haven't we? Psychological stress causes that pylorus to tighten up. And, uh, and the stomach can be a source of a lot of pain and psychological stress and ulcers, you know. And uh, this can also be going on. Now we're going to move on to intestinal congestion. Things that make it so the intestines don't let the traffic move on so that uh, contents of the stomach can move down into the small intestine. If you're all backed up from uh, the bottom up, then you're not going to be able to move tra traffic on down. And so things that cause intestinal congestion are foods that are low in fiber. I mean, 
A lot of the things you get at uh, fast food joints, no fiber in the white bread, no fiber in the meat, a little bit of fiber in the lettuce, albeit very little, and the tomato. So you end up with food with no fiber and it just becomes a brick in your intestine and you end up with slow transit. For example, they did a, a bit of study. Uh, there was a Dr. Burkett, the famous doctor for Burkett's lymphoma. After he retired from uh, some of the things for which he's famous, he went around the world studying people's bowel habits. And uh, for example, he compared Africa to America. Here was one of his comparisons. In Africa, large stools, small hospitals. In America, small stools, large hospitals. <laughs> uh, the other thing he discovered was that uh, when he had the people in Africa uh, check their transit time, he fed them something that would just pass through, that their transit time was less than 24 hours. And then he was actually from Britain, so he went to Britain and he did the same experiment there and he thought he would never find his marker come through, but it came through finally in three days. Which, uh, I mean, the moral of that story is the Brits are three times more full of poop than the Africans. But anyway, the uh, problem here is slow transit and backing up of uh, stool and so forth, congested colon. And so you can't move things on. Constipation, if you, if you please, in many respects. Another part of this is sedentary lifestyle. If you aren't moving around a bit, and you'll notice we talk about walking after meals, and, and we'll talk about that here when we get around to the fixes. But walking after meals, make sure that you keep things moving. Uh, poor posture, I mean, uh, can also affect whether you're cramping your intestines and whether or not they can move uh, freely and send stool on down where it needs to go. Another aspect is clothing that's too tight. When you have a very tight belt, She's got a very tight belt. She's even pulling on the strap to make sure. <laughs> and the tightness around here uh, squeezes the intestines and slows the transit of food. It also increases the temperature of the intestines. It reduces the blood flow to the intestines. All this slows transit time in the intestines and you end up with more congestion poor food traveling through there, a backup, and the stomach can't empty its contents into the small intestine. Does it make sense? All right. Dairy products, especially cheese. Cheese has, well, some of you may know that if you're in the hospital and they give you morphine, your, your stools will slow way down. And that's a chemical effect on uh, opioid receptors in your intestines, but guess what? Cheese hits those same receptors. That's why cheese is so addictive and so hard to give up when people discover that it isn't actually good food. And so milk has that same thing, but it's more concentrated in the cheese. Yogurt has it. And uh, it's the opioid receptor antagonists that cause the bowels to slow down and you get uh, poor transit times. Juice, because they remove all the fiber, it's just going to end up being like other refined foods, and if you're depressed, it slows your intestines. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure which came first here, the chicken or the egg. Maybe the slowed intestines created the depression. I mean, there's very good evidence that that could be true too, but it goes both ways, and so depression plays a role in reflux disease. So studies show that uh, more depression more reflux disease. Well, so far we've covered the different mechanical and chemical uh, causes of uh, reflux or heartburn that uh, I showed you in the, some of those initial slides. There's a few other things that uh, cause reflux or heartburn that uh, don't fit into any good categories. At least they haven't been studied to establish the mechanism. And I just want to mention those in passing. And uh, there are things that a lot of people tell you, yeah, that causes me heartburn. Tomatoes, citrus, and nutritional yeast are things like that. Just uh, not necessary because of, of any reason why tomatoes might be bad for you, but it's just that some people say, yeah, you know, whenever I eat a tomato, I get heartburn, or whenever I eat citrus. So just be aware they're high on the list of probable items that could be creating uh, reflux for you. Nutritional yeast is... Uh, 
just a bit dangerous anyway, it's full of MSG. But uh, meat and eggs. And again, uh, we did mention some of the mechanisms by which uh, these could be creating uh, reflux earlier, but there's other studies they are just plain epidemiological without uh, lots of reasons why. But people who eat more meat have more reflux. And then cheese. Cheese is definitely on the list, and we did mention due to the fact that it's uh, dairy and that it is uh, high in fat. But it uh, could also be to, due to some of the ways they process it with different additives. Vinegar is a big one. Of course, it is acid in and of itself. Um, but uh, studies show that people using more vinegar have more reflux. Some people have uh, vitamin C issues when they eat like citrus. And, uh, or if they're deficient in magnesium or vitamin C. So you might have to find other ways to get your vitamin C. Low in vitamin C means your tissue integrity is probably low, sort of like scurvy. And being low in magnesium means that you're probably having some muscle irritability. Uh, irritability. It might be in the pylorus and emptying the stomach. And then obesity. When you have all kinds of extra weight pressing down on top of your intestines and stomach, things are going to come up. And so obesity is a risk factor for reflux. Improper breathing, like you breathe from your shoulders. And uh, this creates uh, unusual pressures inside the abdomen that shouldn't be there and in the stomach. And it can also put, uh, put uh, a vacuum on the chest in an unusual way that would tend to pull things up the esophagus and cause burning. So those are other reflux risks that have been identified by researchers. Now let's talk a bit about where we don't want our reflux to go. We don't want to get Barrett's esophagus. We don't want to get cancer. What's Barrett's esophagus? Well, Dr. Barrett looked down people's throats enough to figure out that when they had too much reflux, they started getting sores. We call it escoriation, sores in the bottom of their esophagus. And then they would get healing and sores and healing and sores, and then it would turn to cancer. So he got his name applied to this condition. And uh, the, the, the final common pathway then is cancer in the esophagus. So there's certain things that are especially identified as leading to cancer from reflux. A diet deficient in fresh fruits and vegetables, to top the list. So in other words, you eat more fresh fruits and vegetables, and that will help your esophagus heal a lot faster and make it so it's less likely to let any escoriation or sores turn in to cancer. Uh, diet rich in cereals to the neglect of fresh fruits and vegetables. Now there's, you know, by cereals we mean grains. And, and a lot of people when they become a vegetarian, they merely adopt a meat avoidant diet. They don't adopt a good diet. And a lot of times they become grainitarians <laughs> rather than vegetarians. And this was just a study I came across and I thought, thought that was interesting that uh, increasing grains without increasing fresh fruits and vegetables wasn't real helpful for avoiding cancer, especially of the esophagus. If you're deficient in vitamins A, C, and selenium, selenium is a mineral that's very important for fighting cancer. In Australia, it's sort of hard to find because the soils don't have much of it in them. A few years ago the cattle industry figured out that uh, a deficiency of selenium led to cancer and so there was a lot of supplements available for uh, cattle that had selenium in it. And so it's very important to keep your selenium up. It also helps with uh, psychological diseases such as schizophrenia to have plenty of selenium. Uh, meat and high animal fat intake definitely leads to more cancer. Those of you who have been to our cancer lecture will know the mechanisms there, especially processed meat, such as bologna, salami, hot dogs, uh, that kind of thing. Smoking, uh, obesity, sugar, uh, inflammatory diet, all increasing the risk. And uh, <laughs> that was interesting. One study just looked at pizza, and pizza increased the risk of esophageal cancer. So, uh, I don't know if pizza really uh, originated from, uh, from Italy. It probably originated in America in some fast food joint, but anyway. Uh, 
Uh, pizza is a problem. Of course, that's cheese, high in fats, got baking soda, all kinds of things that wouldn't be helpful. And then wearing a belt was associated with more esophageal cancer. Funny associations, huh? Well, we already identified the impact of a belt on your risk of reflux, so there you go. So we've talked about all the things that cause reflux and worse yet cancer, so now we've got to get around to talking about the things that are beneficial, the prevention steps first. How can I prevent reflux? Well, you've uh, guessed it, just don't do all the things we've talked about so far that cause the problem, but eating high fiber, eating fresh fruits and vegetables, there is a very big key. Fiber is very helpful. When you eat more fiber, your stomach is less likely to try to reject the stuff and push it back up your esophagus. Eat mainly low-fat, low-calorie foods and don't overeat. Uh, maintain regularity in your meal schedule. And uh, if you go to my website and download the handout for this lecture, I have a suggested uh, meal schedule uh, laid out there. And uh, anyway, when you eat at the exact same time every day, then your stomach is ready for the food to come. It's got all the digestive juices all sitting out there ready to go, <laughs> to be sort of uh, dramatic here. And uh, when the food comes, it can digest it and get it over with. If you're eating at different times of day all the time, the stomach never knows when it's going to get hit with food, and it's never prepared, and this creates for more reflux disease. Eat at the exact same times every day. Leave at least five hours between your meals. Give the stomach a chance to rest. Then it'll be in better shape to, to hold the food, to uh, preserve it from refluxing. Eat only two meals a day. Skip supper or don't, and don't snack. Uh, if you do eat supper, eat only fresh fruit because it'll digest quickly. I say quickly. Remember, eating in the evening, it takes longer to digest anyway. So eating things that digest quickly makes sense. Don't eat within three hours of going to bed. That way things will be completely digested by the time your head hits the pillow. Take small bites and chew them well so there's not large particles in your stomach floating around irritating things. Take a short walk immediately after meals. This is our digestive walk. When you go walking, then your pelvis is moving, you're massaging your insides, you're encouraging all the peristalsis, the movement of the intestines and stomach to, to uh, be more active. Very good taking a walk immediately after meals. It also makes it so blood doesn't all rush to the stomach and stay there and leave your brain high and dry and other tissues high and dry. Don't make or eat liquid meals, soups, smoothies, porridges. Drink a lot of water. Drink eight to 10 glasses of water a day, taking at least 30 minutes before meals so you don't end up uh, adding food to water, or two hours after meals so you don't end up adding water to stuff in your stomach. And wear warm clothes with no tight bands around your waist. This is very good for making sure you're not squeezing the food back up mechanically externally. So those are preventions. Now let's talk about natural remedies. Okay, my stomach's burning. My pain here is right here. It's like heartburn. What do I do? I'm burning right now. Well, charcoal capsules, tablets, or powder are very effective all the way up to cancer. They're good for reflux. They're good for ulcers. They're good for inflammation. They're good, yeah, for cancer. So, capsules or tablets, you can buy the tablets or capsules in most chemists around around uh, Australia. I found them in just about every place I've gone. Uh, the powder is a little harder to find, but uh, if you ask around, you'll find people either selling it or we buy it online usually. And uh, charcoal has the ability to absorb toxins, has the ability to coat ulcers so they'll heal. Um, and uh, of course, it uh, put into a stomach full of liquid. It has a tendency to uh, thicken it up a bit. So there's a lot of good benefits to charcoal in fighting reflux disease. I mean, this would be a better first pill to take than any of the antacids. Which reminds me, I have a study on my computer here where they looked at the effect of taking an antacid on your ability to digest protein. You take a 
acid reducing pill and all that acid that your stomach was making so you could digest protein it's not going to be able to work and so you become protein deficient what's more you have large chunks of protein trying to go in your bloodstream and so you get allergic to more protein these uh, antacid pills are not going to help you live longer or feel better or be more healthy they're just trying to take away the pain you had for a little bit all right the next one is eat fruit which is quick digesting eat beans which are high in fiber and good complex carbohydrate eat vegetables which are high in minerals and uh, pears, bananas, cucumber, and kiwi are all very good for reflux. Pears are very soothing to stomach. Bananas, especially on the green side, have more prebiotic fiber that feed good bacteria in your intestines and digestive tract. Cucumber and kiwi, all soothing to the digestive tract. Cabbage and its juice are very good for helping to uh, soothe uh, heartburn, pain from a disordered digestive system, a sore esophagus or a stomach with gastri gastritis. Carrots, kale, and radish, all, and this would be not the really hot horseradish, but the red radishes, are soothing to pain broccoli sprouts and what they discovered about broccoli sprouts is that broccoli sprouts have something that actually kills H. pylori which is sometimes blamed for reflux probably inappropriately but broccoli sprouts when they discovered this the price of broccoli sprout, uh, seeds went through the roof and everybody started to eating broccoli sprouts uh, for their reflux and for their H. pylori which is a bacteria that's uh, in the stomach sometimes Another thing that's real good is aloe vera juice. And aloe vera juice uh, is very healing to any esophageal problems or stomach problems. Carob uh, is very soothing. It's high in calcium, incidentally, but it's uh, not so high that it causes reflux hyperacidity. It's just uh, very soothing. Oat bran is a very good prebiotic, again, for for culturing the good bacteria that give you a happy intestines. Dandelion tea, beneficial for reflux disease. And fresh comfrey, very healing, or chicory, very prebiotic. These are things that uh, are very beneficial as natural remedies when you are in pain and when you want to find something that will make a difference. All right, let's get back to Jeanette. She had had her multiple drugs and they only gave her osteoporosis as they can. And then the doctor said, you're crazy, so <laughs> we're gonna give you tranquilizers. And so she started doing some research on her own and decided that, uh, you know, this isn't gonna work. Uh, all these uh, drugs are only get messing up my life. And so she went on a plant-based diet, high in fiber and complex carbohydrates. She started staying away from uh, dairy and meat. And uh, she found that uh, if she avoided fish, uh, salad dressings with their vinegar, ice cream, things like that, that she did much better. And she got off of her uh, acid reflux pills that were causing her uh, problems with osteoporosis. And she said she's, uh, felt she's never felt so good in her life, felt completely and blissfully well. Natural remedies did the trick. So if you go to my website and you go to Dr. Clark's presentation handouts, you'll find all of them down there and then toward the end will be the, the handout for reflux disease. All right, time for a few questions. Yes. Um, that it can actually absorb vitamins and minerals in the stomach as well. And then you've got to be careful how much you take it and when you take it. Are you, I guess if you don't have red box. All right. Uh, the, the question here is, doesn't uh, charcoal absorb uh, vitamins and minerals that you need? And it don't, you have to be careful. They're discovering in animal husbandry that if they add some charcoal to the food of animals, such as cows, chickens, pigs, and so forth, they get healthier, they grow faster, they gain weight faster, they, grow, they give more milk, lay better eggs. Uh, when a person goes to dialysis, they run their blood against charcoal. They don't end up with any glaring vitamin deficiencies or 
mineral deficiencies. So there's been no substantiation of the idea that charcoal would absorb something you need unless you're taking a poison because it will absorb poisons. So if you're taking some pharmaceutical pill, you don't want to take the charcoal at the same time you're taking the pharmaceutical pill because it will absorb that kind of stuff. So there's no evidence that you can't take charcoal every day of your life just like they can feed a pig every day of its life and it gains more weight. And uh, so there's been a lot of discussion on that and a lot of interesting research done to figure that out. Other questions? Yes? When you said uh, overeating can be a problem with food drugs, if you're eating the right foods, can you overeat? <laughs> no. <laughs> Uh, eat, overeating even of the best food will give you the mechanical problem of too much food in a very small space that increases the pressure. Uh, the thing to do is just chew the food very, very, very well and go slowly and then you'll probably be able to get more in because it'll be uh, start absorbing quicker. But no, it's better not to overeat. In fact, think of it like a front loader washing machine. You know, if you pack a front loader washing machine completely full of clothes, it's going to have a hard time tumbling the clothes in order to wash them. Your stomach would be better off being half full and having room to tumble the food around and to mix it than to be so packed full it can't move. And so you're much better off uh, not eat overeating. Yes? Um, how can I increase selenium and magnesium in my diet? Okay, question is how can I increase selenium and magnesium in your diet? The best source of selenium is Brazil nuts. A couple of Brazil nuts a day will give you all the selenium you need. Magnesium is uh, usually from nuts and seeds particularly, like pumpkin seeds and sunflower seeds. We'll have some magnesium. Uh, some green leafy vegetables have quite a bit of magnesium. Uh, otherwise, uh, now some people use magnesium oil and put it on their skin. But uh, some people soak in Epsom salts, which is magnesium-based uh, salt. And we'll get more magnesium. All right, other questions? Yes? When you say that juice and carrots, broccoli, etc., are you um, saying it's better to have them raw or cooked as lettuce? My question is about uh, using cabbage and broccoli and carrots for helping with your reflux or, uh, or soothing your stomach. For that purpose, for using them to treat a stomach problem, you'd either want to take them as juice or probably cooked. They probably, your stomach wouldn't be as happy with them raw.